Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today for Scientists in Action, Animal Anatomy. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I am so excited to be your host and moderator for yet another exciting day of Scientists in Action. Today we're talking to Andy Carrillo. She's the zoology preparator here at the museum, responsible for preparing specimens like the ones you see on the screen behind me to be stored in our collections in perpetuity, which means a really, really, really long time. She's got a fascinating job, and in just a few moments, we're going to talk to her all about what she does every day and what she knows about the animals that she gets to study based on what she can see and observe from their bones, their teeth, their fur, their feathers, and a whole lot else. So we're really excited to get started with her, but I do want to share just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going. Number one, I want to start today by respectfully acknowledging that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science is on the traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Ute, Arapaho, and Osheti Shikoan nations, as well as other traditional keepers. Modern science benefits from the thousands of years of indigenous knowledge held by people living in the United States and across the world, um, even still today. So we are grateful too to the people whose lands we are currently standing and working on and to all of the knowledge that they have given us for generations and for thousands of years. I also want to acknowledge that we are currently connected to students from all across the country. We've got Colorado on with us, Washington, California, Texas, I think I even saw, I gotta look at my list, Florida, Arizona, California, all kinds of people are on with us today. So we are really excited to take questions and observations from students from all across the country. If you are one of our on-camera schools today, please stay muted until we call on you. I will let you know when it is your turn to ask a question and when that time comes, I will spotlight your video feed so that everybody can see your smiling face. I will prompt you to unmute your mic and all you have to do students, come right up to that microphone, tell us your name and ask that question in a nice and loud voice so that we can hear you all the way here in Denver. If you are one of our off camera viewers today, maybe you're doing remote learning, maybe you're watching from your classroom, but you're just not on camera today. I do have the chat closed down for now, but in just a few minutes, you will be able to, I will open it up and you'll be able to submit your questions and your observations through the chat and I'll pull as many as I can to ask our expert. One thing I do wanna ask that all of you keep in mind is just that we wanna use that chat today for questions, for scientific observations, not for things like hi or OMG or just, typing on the keyboard at random and saying, you know, gibberish or something like that. And the reason I ask you for that is just, it's hard for me to find a lot of questions if I'm having to scroll through a lot of different messages that people have sent that aren't questions for our experts. So that's my challenge and my expectation for all of you today. Use the chat only for questions and I'll pull as many as we can. We'll try and get through as many as possible. You also don't need to repeat the questions. I promise if you've sent it in, I have seen it. I may just not be able to pull it right then. I might have others that I need to get to first. So big thanks to all of you who are using the chat today for being patient and being good digital citizens. Without any further ado, I'm gonna bring our expert on camera and I'm gonna say, Andy, give everybody a big wave and a hello, cause I'm gonna kick it over to you in just a second. And I wanna know the first question of the day is your job as a zoology preparator here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. That's kind of a cool and mystical title, like zoology preparator. So what does it mean? What's, what's your job all about? We'll start there. Hi everyone. Um, thank you, Talia. My name is Andy Creo, and I'm the zoology preparator here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, and a lot of people don't really know what a zoology preparator is. Um, I think it's the best job here at the museum. I get to work with animals and I prepare skins, skeletons, parasites, feathers, tissues, all kinds of parts of animals. So once I preserve the parts, then they can go into the zoology collections uh, where they stay in storage. And our zoology collections are far in the basement. Um, so all behind the scenes, not too many people get to see it, but uh, sometimes we do open it up for like events. Um, we have a bunch of storage down there where we keep everything. Um, so when I say zoology, zoology covers a huge range of animals. So anything from insects to corals, to birds, mammals, and fish. Um, what I work on are vertebrates, specifically mammals and birds. So vertebrates are animals that have a backbone or a spine. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about the most today. Uh, in our collection, we have over 50,000 mammals and over 70,000 birds. And I know what you're probably thinking, that's a whole lot of animals, right? Where do you get all that stuff? And some of our stuff has been in our collections since the museum opened and actually predates the museum opening. So some, th some of those things have, were collected and prepared in the 1800s. 
Um, and back then they used to have very different methods of collecting their specimens. Today it's highly regulated and we need permits from the state and the federal government. Um, and we need just permissions to house our animals and to take animals from the wild. So the permit that we use uh, the most is our salvage permit. Our salvage permit is what allows people to bring animals to the museum that they find in their backyard or that they found um, on the road. It also allows us to work with a whole bunch of wildlife rehabs around the Denver metro area. So some of them um, specialize in birds, some of them specialize in mammals, some of them specialize in very specific mammals or birds like bunnies or raptors. And we work with them because they get a whole lot of animals that were hit by a car, they hit a window, killed by a cat, and sometimes those animals just don't make it. And when they don't make it, they can come here and live on their, as their second life um, as museum specimen. So we can still learn a lot from them and we can still use them for um, our, our storage and in our museum. Thanks for that explanation, Andy. I always like to start with this kind of discussion when we talk about this kind of stuff. Why do we keep things behind the scenes of the museum? How does it all get there? Because I'm willing to bet that a lot of you probably had that question already. Wait, so how do all of the things make it to the museum? Do you go out and get them or do they just come to you or how does that all work? So we wanted to get that out of the way early. And if you do have more questions about how exactly that works, in just a few minutes, we will get to take some questions and you're welcome to ask us a little bit more, but we wanted to share that right at the top. Now, before we jump in too deep, because Annie's got some really cool stuff to show us, I won't give too much away just yet, but she's got a lot of really neat things on the table out in front of her right now. I want to start us off with a little bit of a poll. Why do you think, students, why do you think we keep specimens at the Museum of Nature and Science? And why do museums across the world do that too? So you're going to see a poll pop up. And teachers, you can survey your group. If you're watching with the group, maybe go with majority rules. If you're watching all on your own, you get to just cast your own vote. Why do you think we keep animal specimens? We keep lots of different kinds of specimens. We keep rocks, we keep fossils. I don't know, we keep textiles and paintings and pots and all that stuff, but why do you think we keep animals? Is it to teach about animals to other people? Is it to learn about the past? Is it for scientific research or is it a mix of all of those things? So cast your votes, we'll leave it open for, looks like almost 75% of people have voted, so hopefully not that much longer. Get those votes in real quick and we will reveal the right answer. Get those votes in. Looks like almost everybody has voted, so I think I'll close it up in about 10 seconds. I have my own guess, we'll see if I'm right. All right, let's take a look at those results. It looks like we got votes in all of those categories, but the big winner is all of the above. So Andy, I'm gonna switch the spotlight over to you, and you can tell us. Yeah. Are they right? They are correct. Yes, it is all of the above. We can do a whole lot of things with our specimens. So the one that you're participating in today, right, all of you, is teaching, I'm teaching you about animals. You are learning about animals. So something like this little mink, this is something that I prepared yesterday. Um, it's something that I would probably take out for like an open house or of course to show to all of you um, and just talk about what a specimen is. And it's a really great example of, yes, this was a roadkill, but we're able to preserve it for future use um, either in research or in teaching or in whatever ways uh, we can use it for. Um, so that's learning about animals. Uh, we also can learn about the past and I'll use this little uh, Townsend Solitaire as an example. So we have a bunch of specimens that go back to the 1800s. So about the 1850s are some of our oldest specimens. Um, and we can compare those really old specimens to this specimen that was collected in 2017. And we can look at a bunch of different things. So we can do genetic analysis and genetic sequencing. Um, maybe we have tissues for this one. Maybe we need to take a little bit of skin from the feet. Uh, we can use all of that to do genetic sequencing and we can see if uh, there's any genetic differences or genetic sim similarities between 
this Townsend Solitaire and a Townsend Solitaire from the 1800s and see how that's changed over time. Uh, another thing that we can learn from the specimens is uh, what they ate. Um, so even though we don't have guts in this bird right now, and we don't have guts in a bird from the 1800s, we can pluck a feather and use the DNA on the root or the isotopes on the root and do something called isotope analysis. And that means that we can figure out what an animal is eating back in the 1800s and see if we have a specimen from the same location, um, what they were eating in modern times. So we can learn a whole lot from just one little specimen. Um, and then there's scientific research. So one of my favorite things to work on here at the museum are um, bones because I get to work with flesh eating beetles. So I'll change the cameras real quick. Oh, it got stuck. Oh, I'm back. <laughs> there it is. Our All cameras right. are, are tricky to use sometimes. A little bit, but we got it. All right, so we have some flesh eating beetles in here in our tank. So we have about eight more tanks that have a whole lot of bones in there. So when an animal comes in, I need to, you know, dissect it and I'll take the skin off of the skull like I did here. I'll take a little bit of the muscle off and then it can go into the bugs and the bugs will eat up all that muscle. So you can clearly see the bone. And with this bone, you can learn a lot about pathology. So learning how an animal died, if it had any injuries, how old the animal was. Um, and we can also do some really fun math and uh, measure parts of the skull and figure out how old an animal was when it died. So when I talk about pathology and looking at animals and age, we can look at something like this big bone and you see this plate right here, that means that the animal still had some time to grow. So it was a young animal. So we can learn a whole lot from that. Um, additionally, I also have some really cool parasites and we can use parasites to kind of figure out um, what uh, kind of interaction these parasites have with our specimens. So a lot of times parasites will evolve with our specimens. So we can take uh, DNA from both and see how, uh, if the branching of their DNAs and branching of the species is similar in both species and see if they evolve together versus separately. Um, are those yeah. worms, Andy? Is that what you've got in that vial? Are those worms? Yes, I have. These are tapeworms from a bunny. Oh, I can see it really clearly now. Oh, those are cool. Yeah. Yeah, they're, uh, they're pretty fun. I, it's always a little surprise when you find parasites, but it's a fun surprise. Very good. All right, and I'll wait for you to switch back to the front-facing camera. I know sometimes they're a little bit tricky to switch. Cool. There you go. Um, I think at this point we're ready for some questions. Is that about right? Or is there anything else you wanted to share with us before we move on? Okay, I see your thumbs up. So here's how we're gonna do this, everybody. We are gonna start by taking questions from our on-camera schools first. We're going to start by taking two from Bridges Elementary School down in Arizona and then two from Nativity School here in Colorado. So students, your teacher can call on you and send you up toward the webcam and the microphone. And I will let you know again when it's your turn to ask a question. I will spotlight your video feed so that everybody can see your face. You will need to unmute on your side and students make sure you use a nice, loud and clear voice to ask that question. And if you remember, tell us your name. We will also try and pull as many questions from the chat as we can. So I'm gonna open that up here in just a few minutes. And remember what we are looking for in that chat are just questions today. If you have some observations, some really scientific observations that you wanna make things like, I noticed that the skull that you were holding onto was colored like this. Those are scientific observations that use describing words. What I'm not looking for today are things like OMG or hi or ew or just smashing on the keyboard because again, that makes it hard for me to find questions that we can answer and it means you might not get your question answered. And that's a bummer. So we're gonna try and get through as many as we can. We may not be able to answer every question that comes to us today. We'll try our best. And again, you can help me out a lot by making sure that you're just putting those questions in the chat. All right, Bridges Elementary, it looks like you've got a student up at the camera and ready to go. So we're gonna switch over to you. Um, so my name is Danny and um, does like an animal get 
like when an animal gets old, does their sing or their fur like get older or like? Yeah. So like, what can you tell yeah. about an animal's age? Yeah. Like, how do you can you guys like tell that? Good question. Yeah, very good question. So, um, yes, we can tell for the most part an animal's age, mostly based on the bone. So uh, if you think about like, if you have a dog or a cat, right, you'll notice that it starts walking a little bit uh, slower as it gets older. That's probably because it has like maybe some bone spurs or a little bit of arthritis. Um, we'll see that in our pathology. So sometimes I don't have one with me, unfortunately, but sometimes we do see animals with big bone spurs. Um, and those typically mean that it's an older animal or if they have really worn down teeth, that can tell us it's older. I do have something that is very young here. So I have this giraffe uh, jaw right here. Um, and I can tell that it's a very young giraffe because if I put this a little closer, you can see its teeth are very, they're pretty sharp, right? They're not worn down, they're not dull or anything like that. And if you look back here, you'll notice that this tooth is still growing in. So it's very similar to people where as you get older, your jaw starts to grow and that means that more teeth can fit in it and your teeth, your adult teeth will start coming in, your adult molars will start coming in. Same thing happens with animals. Um, but yeah, that's just one example. I think teeth is definitely the one that we use the most to determine age. Yeah, all of you watching at home, maybe some of you are still in the process of losing your first set of teeth, mm -hmm. or maybe you're feeling your molars start to grow up because humans have the same thing. Not all of our teeth come in right when we're, you know, a kid. It takes a little while. Yeah. Awesome. Let's grab one more question from Bridges. So we're going over to you. <laughs> You can tell it's warmer in Arizona than it is here in Colorado because I see you all in the church. Uh, my name is Caitlin, and what is the oldest um, bird you found if you can determine the age? What is the oldest bird we found? Is that your question? Mm -hmm. Great question. All right. Andrew. Oh, okay. So... That's a very good question because it has a few different answers. So our oldest specimen is from the 1800s, right? Our oldest bird specimen is from the 1800s, like mid 1800s, 1850s. Um, oldest by age when it died, that's hard to say. Um, I've definitely seen, I definitely know that I've prepped some birds that are in their 50s. Um, some birds are very long lived and live as long as about people. Um, so I've definitely done a bird in its 50s. Um, and the oldest bird that I've found that was like the oldest bird that was collected, um, I found a bird last year from the 1970s in our freezer. And as you can imagine, it was very dry and it felt like jerky. So all I was able to save from that was a skull and a little bit of tissue. But yeah, it's a good question because it has a whole lot of answers. Right. But thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, there are a few different ways that you could answer that one. Basically, mm -hmm. Andy gets to do a lot of stuff. Huge yeah. thanks to Ms. Morris group at Bridges Elementary in Arizona. We're going to take two now from Ms. Flesher's group at Nativity School in Broomfield, Colorado. And then I see questions coming in in the chat. Huge thanks to all of you who are doing such a great job of asking those really scientific questions. Well, we're doing a fabulous job so far. Keep up the good work. All right, Nativity School, we are going to go over to you and you can ask us your first question. You need to unmute, looks like. Is a oh, it looks like you all might have frozen. Let's see. Maybe they need a minute to come on back. Sometimes mm -hmm. we end up with, with tech glitches. You know what? Here's what I'm going to vote we do. Um, I'm going to say until we see them come back, let's pull a couple of questions from the chat. Tech things happen. We've all been doing remote learning and remote teaching all year. We all know that really well. So let's take a look at some questions from the chat. I see a lot of questions, Andy, coming in about you, wondering, did you always want a job like this? What inspired you to become a zoology preparator? And of course, we knew we were gonna get this question. Do you ever think it's gross? So tell us about your job. <laughs> yeah, um, so did I always wanna be a zoology preparator? No, I didn't even know that the job existed until 
I would say my sophomore year of college. So I went into school knowing that I really wanted to work with animals. Um, and that's pretty much all I knew. I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. And then I realized that I don't really want to take care of dogs and cats. I really like wildlife and I like being out in nature and learning about these super diverse species. And um, so I changed majors. I changed to a wildlife major um, my sophomore year in college. And then I found out that my university had a museum and they were offering up internships. So I interned there and I pretty much started preparing uh, when I was in college, when I was 19. And since then I was hooked. Since then, I was like, I need to work at a museum in whatever capacity. And it just so happened that right after I graduated, this job opened up and I was able to do this for a living, which I never thought would be possible. Um, but here I am, I'm doing this. And it's great. I love my job so much. It's so much fun. <laughs> it is really um, cool. It is really yeah. Cool. There's you. Um, and what was the other one? Sorry. <laughs> Um, there are a couple of questions that I can pull. Just things like, what do you do? Um, the other one that came in at first is, what do you do when you think something is gross? Or do you think this kind of stuff is gross? We knew we were going right. to get that question. Yes, I get that question a lot, especially when we take people into the lab. Um, but it really depends on you, right? I'm very used to all the stuff and dissections and everything. Um, I find it really normal. It's kind of like, if any of you um, hunt or have families that hunt, that's a very normal thing that you experience. You might have to go and field dress a deer out in the field and that involves you know, skinning and taking out the guts. And that's just a normal thing for some people. So it really just depends on you and what you can handle and what your experiences are. But I feel like I was never grossed out by this kind of stuff. I always thought it was way more fascinating than gross. That being said, there are some times when there is a bit of a smell and it can get a little bit gross. But when, it, when that happens, I just kind of step away and center myself and then I can get back into it because I know this is my job and this is what comes with the job. Yeah, two super important points there is that what we, what we consider gross is often a really personal thing. And sometimes it's influenced by like, yeah, the activities that you do, the culture that you grew up in, depending on the culture that you were raised in, you might think some things that maybe I think are totally normal, are disgusting. And that's that's okay. But yeah, sometimes things do get stinky. Stinkiness is kind of gross across the board. So you got to step away sometimes. And, and remember, yeah, it's super cool. Um, I'm going to pull some more questions from the chat. It actually looks like we lost Nativity School. Maybe they had an, an internet glitch and caused them to have to drop off. Um, one thing I will say, though, is I have closed down the chat. I did see two students um, from either Mr. or Ms. Todd's group and then a student from Ms. Marsh's group putting questions in the chat over and over and over again. And y'all, I have to scroll way up to try and find different questions. So I've closed down the chat for a few minutes. Maybe we'll open it up again in a few, but remember that's not what we're looking for today. We're looking for you to just put your question in once and then be patient. It might take me a few minutes to get to it. All right, let's take a look. Ooh, so here's sort of a two-part question. I'm gonna ask this question from a student and then I'm gonna add one of my own in there to help sort of deepen the discussion a little bit. This student from Melissa Marsh's group is wondering, have you ever worked with like a mammoth or a mastodon or maybe something from the ice age? And one thing I'm gonna add in here is that's almost getting into paleontology a little bit. What, what's the difference between what you do and what a paleontologist does? So let's take that question next. Mm. Yeah, very good question. Um, so no, I have not worked with a mastodon or a mammoth or anything like that. Um, those are from the Ice Age, those are considered prehistoric animals, um, and those are extinct animals, right? The animals that I work with now are all extant, meaning that they're still alive today. Um, and the big difference between uh, zoology and paleontology is, yes, they are both working with animals, but they're animals from very different time periods. So. Paleontology works with fossils. These are all animals that were around tens, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, and those are all fossils. So that is uh, rock. So the bone has then turned into rock. Um, where I work with things that, where the bone is still bone, it still hasn't turned into rock. Um, even if we find something that is below the ground, like some bones, it is, um, 
it's not going to be long enough for it to uh, turn into rock at all. Yeah, important distinction there. Paleontologists work on fossils, things from a really, really long time ago, from animals, plants, microbes, all kinds of stuff. Andy works on animals that are still alive today and that we're still, or I should say extant. That, that's your science word for the day. It's the opposite yes. of extinct. I do see now that it looks like our friends at Nativity have rejoined us. We missed you, but now you are back. And I think we can go ahead and take those two questions from you. And it even looks like you've got a student ready to go at your microphone. So let's go over to you. Thanks for coming back and we'll try it again. So I'm gonna spotlight you now. And you'll need to unmute. If a bird doesn't have flight, can, can it fly because a chicken has flight and lift? Oh, good question. So it looks like you all might have watched the video that we sent out before the program with Andy mm -hmm. doing chicken dissection, and that's got chicken on the brain today. So tell us a little bit about flightless birds and birds that can fly and where chickens fit in that equation, because they certainly don't fly very well. Right. So uh, that's a really good question. So there's a lot of different flightless birds around the world. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're related. There's penguins, right? There's um, ostriches and emus. Um, and those have, they just have different, uh, different ways of life, right? They fill a, what's called a niche. So it's kind of like their place in their environment. Um, and sometimes flightlessness just fills that perfect niche. Um, animals like uh, chickens and pheasants that don't fly very well, um, evolution has determined, hey, you don't really need to flight to, to fill this niche. It's fine if you can't migrate, you can just live here year round. Um, and that's why they're not very good at flying because typically chickens um, originated from uh, jungles and like the tropics of uh, Southeast Asia. So it stays really warm there year round. So they wouldn't have to migrate like animals here in Denver, right? Where it gets really cold and they're like, hey, maybe it's a little too cold for us to live here. We should go uh, south for the winter, like towards where the equator is, where it stays really nice. Um, so that's one reason why chickens just evolved to not be so great at flight. And then there's other animals like albatrosses and uh, raptors that are very good at flight and can fly for very long amounts of time without a whole lot of energy. And that's because, again, they're filling this niche in their ecosystem that has evolved over hundreds of thousands of years um, where like albatrosses are living out in the open ocean and they just, there's nothing out there. So they gotta fly for really long periods of time in order to reach an island and raptors need to circle around and um, soar so they can find prey. So it all comes down to evolution and what an animal is really good at and what evolution has determined that the animal would succeed in? Very there's, good question. There's a, yeah, that was a super good question. And I've literally never thought, I've been a scientist for a long time, I literally never thought where chickens came from. That's never been a question in my head. And now I'm not gonna be able to stop thinking about it. So amazing. There's a really important nugget in what Andy just said. You can learn a lot about an animal's environment by looking at its body and kind of vice versa too. And so that's part of why jobs like Andy's are really important for museums and for scientists because she can actually perform the dissection. She can study the parts of an animal's body that lead us to say, oh, well, this bird has a certain wing structure, had certain kinds of feathers. So it must've been a flyer. It must've been a, a glider, you know, like an albatross or it must be doing something different because it doesn't seem to be a really good flyer. That's a really important clue for scientists learning about the history of life on earth and even learning about species that still are alive today that we just don't know a lot about. So really good question. And again, I'm gonna be thinking about chickens for the whole rest of the day. Let's grab one more from Nativity School and then we have another poll question coming up because we want you to choose what we take a look at next. So we're gonna go back to Nativity School. You'll need to unmute again and then we're off and away. Oh, how do you get these animals in a collection? How do you get the animals mm. in a collection? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a pretty long process, I will say, but I'll try to condense it um, so I don't bore you too much. Um, but an animal starts off in the wild, right? It may get hit by a car. It may get um, injured by a cat. 
and then it goes to a wildlife rehab center. If it doesn't uh, make it uh, in the wildlife rehab center, then it can come to us. And when it comes to us, it stays stored in a walk-in freezer for a little while until I can get it into my lab and I can prepare it. And once it's prepared, um, let's say I turn it into a steady skin like this bird, um, then it goes into a freezer for a couple weeks to make sure that there's no pests on it. And then it goes down into our collections and sorted and stored. So you can see there's a video right now with our curator of ornithology, Garth, and he's showing off what those collections look like. So it's just a whole bunch of drawers with birds that are on their backs and they're all laid out by species and they're laid out by, um, by location. And that way it makes it very easy for us to find all of our specimens. Um, but they live there for the rest of their specimen lives, um, waiting for us to use them for education or for research. But that's pretty much all of it condensed down. Good question. A long process. There's, there's a reason that we have people like Andy whose whole job it is, is to get things into the collection and preserve them. If you watched the videos that we sent out before the event, and if you didn't, don't worry, it's totally okay. We talked a little bit about museums have a responsibility to keep our collections and our specimens in perpetuity. So theoretically, in a thousand years, someone could show up at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and who knows, maybe we'll have like flying cars and we'll be the Denver Museum of Fleet Corps, but that, I don't know. But they should be able to say, hey, I want to go see your Rosie Finch's collection, and we should be able to take them down there. I'm going to go ahead and shut the chat down again. I opened it up and I'm seeing again, repeat questions come in. That is not what we are looking for, um, everybody. I'm seeing a lot of questions come in just again and again and again. So we're going to go ahead and close that down. Sorry about that. All right, let's take a look at our next poll. Um, that poll is going to pop up on your screen in just a moment. And it is asking you to let us know which of the specimens that you saw before do you want to learn more about? So do you want to take a closer look at those flesh eating beetles? Take a look at some of the bones that they've helped us clean off too. Do you want to look at parasites? Or do you want to look at preserved animals? So animals that are supposed to be, you know, alive or if not alive, but around and kept in perpetuity. I did see one question from someone saying, what's a parasite? A parasite is a creature like a tick or a flea or a tapeworm that lives on the body or in the body of an animal. Um, and you might have a better explanation for it than me. But we'll leave this poll up for another maybe 30 seconds. Andy, do you have a better idea of what a parasite is than I do? That was a pretty good explanation. Yeah, <laughs> a parasite is just something that requires another organism to survive. So it's not like a bacteria. It's not like a virus. It is a, a, an animal. Um, but there, we have a lot of endoparasites, which are from the inside of the body, and ectoparasites, which are found on the outside of the body. Very but yeah, good. you got it, Kalia. Yay, well good, I, I've been doing this a long time, so I hope so. Um, I'm gonna ask our technical director to bring my face back on the camera. Thank you very much. All right, we are ready to take a look at our results, and it looks like preserved animals is the winner. So Andy, You've got all kinds of cool stuff on that table in front of you. So what can you show us in terms Ooh. of preserved animals? I do have a lot of things. There's one big thing that I haven't shown you all yet. I'm going to pull that out. One second. So this big friend, <laughs> this is an American white pelican. So you can see its face there. It's got a wing on the other side. Um, this American white pelican was collected here in, uh, in Aurora, so really close to Denver. Um, it was collected in October, which is very unusual because uh, American white pelicans are a migrant species here in Denver. They're here in the summer and then they leave um, and they fly uh, to the like tropics down to Louisiana and a little farther south um, in the wintertime. So finding it in October is a little bit strange. This one was found on a golf course of all places. They really like hanging around lakes. So out here where the museum is, we have a big lake, we'll see pelicans here. But you'll notice something very interesting about this study skin, right? It has, it has no wing on this side. So no wing right there tucked behind the head, but there is a wing on the other side. That's because it was really badly injured. Um, it had a really old injury where its wing, um, where the wrist was, was broken and it had healed incorrectly. So it couldn't fly. 
So that kind of explains why it was here in October. And I had to cut the wing off because if not, it would have stuck out just like my arm right here. Um, and we don't want that for the collections. In the collections, we want things to lay flat and we want things to stay inside of a drawer. And having a wing out like that would not be beneficial for us and for our storage situation. So I had to cut it off and it's gonna get skeletonized and the, the beetles are gonna clean it up and uh, it'll eventually join the, the pelican down in the collections in the storage once it's down downstairs. So yeah, very big specimen to show you. I thought it would be a really fun one. I'm kind of cracking up because it looks a little bit like you're holding a tray full of, you know, entrees or appetizers at a restaurant. Yes, it kind of is. <laughs> <laughs> I do see a few questions while Andy puts that down. I did see a few questions come in about that specimen. And so I do have the mm -hmm. chat and back up. We're going to try it again. But remember, everybody, we are looking just for questions to come in. So far, so good. Please do not put repeats in the chat. I'm watching and I may just not have gotten to your question yet. I may not have the right moment for it just yet. Um, and please, of course, remember to put only questions in there and not things like hi, just so we can get through as many as possible. So some of the questions that I saw come in while we were holding that pelican skeleton, which is kind of a tongue twister, um, is why did it have white eyeballs? And I think some other observant souls noticed that there were pins sticking out of it. So why do you have those features on that study scan? And I think the mink had that too. So what can you tell us about that? Yes, so I'll start with the eyeballs and I'll grab a couple things to kind of show you what I'm talking about. So I'll use this smaller study skin as an example, um, but you'll notice this one also has white eyeballs. That's just cotton. So when I prepare specimens, I need to take out all the parts that would start to rot in storage if I just left them in. So all the guts are missing, all the insides are missing. Um, the eyeballs, just like our eyeballs, have liquid inside of them. And we don't want to keep that with the skin. So what I do is I pull them out and then I stuff them with cotton. And because the eyeball would normally sit in something like this, like this little, um, this little socket right there, we, need, we still need to fill that out because there's skin that lays on top of it. And we want that skin to look as natural as possible. So here you can see that eye socket right there. So that would have to get filled up with cotton. And then eventually, once you pull the skin over it, it just ends up looking like a white eyeball. But that's why we have the white, it's just cotton. Um, and then the pins. So we use, I have a few examples of animals with pins in them. So this mink also has pins and that's just because it's drying. So um, just like if you have like a, a rawhide for your dog, that's skin, right? The skin underneath here, underneath all this fur can crinkle up and will start to morph as it dries up because it just shrinks up. Um, and these pins help it so that it just stays in place and it stays the way that I want it to, to stay. And it'll just stay like that for ever and ever. Um, eventually I will take the pins out and it will turn into just a standalone skin like this and it won't move around. That's what the Very pins good. are for. Very good. I've seen a few more questions come in in the chat from a lot of different people. This is the best when so many people have the same question because it means that we get to answer a lot of people's questions at the same time. Um, one question that I saw come in is when you prepare a study skin like that, what do you do with the guts and with the eyeballs? We knew we were going to get that one too. Yes. So um, the guts, there's, there's a whole lot of things that we can do. So by the guts, I mean the intestines, right? So the intestines will actually go through them and look for parasites. So kind of like these, uh, these worms right here. We'll look for parasites like that um, and we'll note if we find them and we'll preserve the parasites that we do find. Um, we preserve heart, liver, muscle, and kidney tissues for DNA extractions, for toxicology research, um, for mitochondrial DNA research. So all kinds of genetics and toxicology and stuff that I'm not an expert in, so I won't talk anymore about that. Um, and we'll also note any kind of disease in there. So sometimes I'll find animals with tumors or I'll find animals with um, fungal infections and I'll note that in my notes. Mm. 
Um, and yeah, that's pretty much, that's what we do with the guts, um, the guts. So pretty much all the organs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What was the second part of that question? Sorry. What do you do with the eyeballs? Oh yes, the eyeballs. So for mammal eyeballs, mammals don't have anything special with our eyeballs. Um, they're just sacks of fluid that help you see. So those I just pull out and then toss them in the trash. Um, sometimes we do save eyeballs for things that are rare. Um, we, we work with researchers and sometimes they have very specific research interests. So we can preserve eyeballs if they request it. But for birds, I think it's a little more interesting because birds have bones in their eyes. Let me get into this. Let me get into the other camera. You're kind of making me laugh because it reminds me of like makeup tutorials on YouTube. I'm sure some of our <laughs> students watching today or like have seen people showing up toys where they have to like put it up it to the camera totally like this. It totally does. Yes. I love that comparison. Um, but birds have, bird eyeballs are a little more complicated because they have these bones in them. They're called sclerotic rings and they would fit right in here into the socket and we need to save those because they are bone. So we would take out the eyeball, make sure to save this ring and it would get saved with the rest of the skeleton like this skull. Um, but the rest of the eyeball, like the, the gunk inside of it, like the lens and um, all the juices can all get tossed out. But that's what we do. Pretty Very fun. Good. Very good. Um, let's take, we have only a few minutes left. So I'm gonna pull, I think the questions that I've seen, a few questions that I've seen in the chat. Um, I am so sorry to say everybody, we are definitely not gonna be able to get to every single question that has come in. And that's just because we only have so much time. So if we didn't get to your question today or if we don't answer your question today, here's my challenge to you. I want you to remember it. And I want you to figure out where you can look it up and figure out where you might be able to find that answer. We do have some information on our DMNS website. So you might be able to learn a little bit more about Andy and some of the work she does and our zoology collection. Good old Google. We talk about this with scientists all the time. Google is an amazing tool. Do a little bit of research. So we'll try and pull as many as we possibly can. Um, one that I really want to answer because I think it's a really important question to have answered and share with everybody is a few of our viewers have noticed that some of the animals have tags on them. What is the purpose of the tags? Yeah, very good observation, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so let me pull one that's pretty easy to see the tag on. So this wing, right, it has a little tag hanging on there. That tag has a bunch of information to identify this particular specimen. So all of our specimens have numbers that are um, unique to them. So this one is number DZTB 13811. And on top of that number, we also have the sex of the animal. So this one was male. And we also have the name. So this is Turtus migratorius or an American robin. Um, and because we have so many uh, specimens of the same species, we can use this tag and this information on the tag to identify which species exactly or which individual goes to this wing. Because when it goes downstairs into the collections, it actually gets another tag with even more information. So this tag is just um, a temporary tag. The final tag will have all of the location data, when it was collected, who collected it, who collected it, who prepared it, and all of that information. So yeah, very good observation, everyone. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's an important question. That's why I pulled it, because it's a huge part of what we do here at the museum, is we have mm -hmm. to keep track of all of that data. Um, another question that I saw a million times is, do you get to work on anything really big? And if so, what's a really big thing that you've gotten to work on? I do get to work on really big things. Um, so some of the really big things that I get to work on are like the pelican that I showed earlier. I can pull it up again, just because it's so much fun to see. I think it's a really cool one. Um, so things like this pelican are probably some of the more common things that I work on. I've worked on a trumpeter swan before, which is even bigger than a pelican. Um, and really uh, large animals like, uh, like uh, what's it called? A puma or mountain lion. I've worked on one of those before. So um, things that are well over a hundred pounds I've also worked on. So, but I think the stuff that's the most fun are the teeny tiny ones. So I've worked on hummingbirds, I've worked on shrews, and other super tiny things. And I think those are even more fun than the really, really big things There's because they're just, 
there's such a challenge. I love a challenge. There you go. Yeah. Being a scientist is all about saying yes to challenges sometimes because weird mm -hmm. stuff happens and you got to be ready to take it on. Okay. And I think this is going to be our last question, but this is yet another one that I saw come up multiple times. Um, what inspired you to be a scientist? We might've already answered that one already, but it's always worth saying. And what sorts of things specifically did you study? It sounds like we have people who are really interested in doing something like what you do when they grow up. So what mm -hmm. advice do you have for someone who might want to be a zoologist or a zoology preparator or work in collections at a museum at some point in the future? Yeah. Oh, that's a really good question. My interest in science started very, very young. I was always out collecting bugs and interested in nature. And luckily I had the opportunity to go to museums and um, interact with nature in really meaningful ways. And any advice I would say is just stay curious and keep questioning the world and how things work because eventually, who knows, you might be the scientist that gets to answer those questions. That's true, that's true. We need a lot of curious people out there to help us answer the big questions that we haven't quite figured out yet. All right, everybody, it is the end of our time together today. So I do just wanna say on behalf of both Andy Carrillo and myself, a huge thank you to all of you for tuning in today. It was really great to have you all on. Um, I hope you'll tune in for our next Scientists in Action event. Next month, we are gonna be talking with the engineers that are part of the effort to land the Perseverance rover on the red planet. So on Thursday, February 25th, we're gonna be talking to the scientists that are part of that work. So make sure you tune in there. You can sign up on our website, dmns.org slash virtual. I think it should be open for registrations hopefully sometime this week, I will send an email. And as well, teachers, you can book an experience for your group. We also will book them for homeschools, for learning pods. We know that this is a weird year, so we will be flexible for the date and time of your choosing and scholarship funding is available. On camera schools, please feel free to unmute yourself if you like, and you can say a big goodbye and we'll see you next time, everybody. Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.